Growing quickly, Joe. I think you're at 70 now. Okay, good. <laughs> well, welcome to uh, session two of Nuts and Bolts and New Ventures. Just to review, uh, last night uh, I did an introduction uh, going through all of the questions you need to get answers for or at least think about as an entrepreneur. Uh, we then had breakout rooms uh, where because of the virtual thing we're doing here, it's hard to get people to meet in person. So we have these breakout rooms by special interest group. Uh, and then Bob Jones came in and talked about finding your customer. So I think all in all, it went pretty well last night, at least logistically. Uh, I, we did post the slides from last night or on the nutsandbolts.mit.edu uh, slash session one PHP page. The video from my part has been posted. The part from uh, Bob is still being processed and hopefully will be up within half hour here. Um, so we're gonna follow the same uh, format tonight. Uh, tonight's topics, we start off with business models with Rich Kivel. You know, uh, Bob talked about finding your customer, but as we talked in the questions last night about um, uh, you know, you have a customer, and the question is, do you have the right business model? You find you have somebody who wants something, say transportation. You could be a taxi, or you could be a uh, an Uber. So business models are how you capture some of the value uh, that you create with the product and the customer. Uh, and then we'll follow Rich with the breakout session, and then uh, we have a, a panel on people and organizational issues. People are always a major issue. That's the only way ventures actually work is with people. And you'll hear from some founders about issues they've faced and some pitfalls you might want to avoid or some things you might want to do. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Rich Kivel. Rich is a serial entrepreneur. Um, he was a judge for a number of years at the 100K competition. I think you actually stepped up and helped out one of the companies as acting CEO after a while. Um, during part of your career. Uh, he followed me as chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum, and he's been uh, doing work all over the world in entrepreneurship. Uh, I haven't caught up with what he's done in the last year, so but uh, trust me, he's got lots of experience, and um, we're paying him just what we pay Bob, exactly zero dollars. So you're going to earn every, every penny there, Rich, so off to you. <laughs> Uh, Joe, thank you so much, and and, and thanks especially to the uh, the, the team uh, behind Joe that's helped put all of this together. Um, uh, it's it's wonderful to see everybody, and uh, clearly we, uh, we I think we perfected this Zoom world of uh, presentations. Uh, although I miss being in ten to fifty. Um, so as Joe said, my my name is Richard Kibble, and uh, I've I've had the good opportunity to to be working. Uh, with people like Joe and others at MIT for, for darn near 20 years. Um, and, and while I've done most of that, probably 15, 16 years of that, um, I was an entrepreneur uh, running and building companies, usually for venture capital firms. Uh, so helping them establish uh, new entities, expand into new markets, and, and of course, raise capital and build teams. Um, as, as Joe said a few moments ago, people are uh, a major issue. Um, it was once quoted that, uh, you know, if, if I could run my company without the annoying people and customers, it would be a lot more fun. Uh, however, that isn't the case. And uh, the customers drive the business and uh, it also changes the business model, which is what we're gonna talk about uh, today during uh, my short remarks and, and presentation. Um, Please uh, feel free to raise your hand or jump in with questions. I think uh, Joe's team is moderating that, or we could do some at the end, whichever, whichever works for folks. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, so uh, before I do, I'll just mention, so my background was in technology and then in the field of healthcare and biotech. Uh, as Joe mentioned, um, uh, I started in technology, then I actually wound up running, uh, being CEO of a company that uh, was a winner of the MIT entrepreneurship competition uh, a very long time ago uh, in the area of bioinformatics. So essentially software for scientists. Uh, I then went on to move to Europe 
and run a number of companies after that uh, that were venture capital backed. Uh, I spent a couple of years at, at a hedge fund in Connecticut um, and then uh, decided at that point, uh, I wanted to start doing my own investing. Uh, started investing specifically in European companies. Uh, although I'm an American, I've spent a lot of my career uh, in the UK and Spain and elsewhere. And I saw a great opportunity in Europe, primarily because uh, you have phenomenal universities, great technology, lots of innovation, uh, but not a lot of funding. Uh, and we saw a real opportunity to build a venture capital fund that was doing growth stage venture. Uh, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of funds that are doing really early stage. Um, but a lot of them are very focused geographically. And, and we built uh, a firm called Gray Bella Capital, which is focused on that sort of series A through C financings in Europe. Uh, we invest uh, in complex technology as well as healthcare companies. So that includes diagnostics, uh, platform technologies, robotics, space tech, fintech, um, mostly B2C uh, from a business model perspective. And um, then our model is very much build uh, and grow the companies in Europe and uh, take advantage of the lower valuations and then, then expand the companies into the US for, for not only uh, sales and marketing uh, and future financing, but for exits uh, as well. Uh, so for those of you that are uh, starting companies that have a great European connection, uh, please let me know. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen uh, very quickly which, uh, let's see here. Uh, I can't see what you see, but uh, please let me know if that slide is showing up saying nuts and bolts of new ventures. Uh, Rich, we're seeing your presentation screen. So we're seeing the next slide, et cetera, if you want to adjust that. Yeah, let me adjust that. And we've also got a question uh, for you. Where is Rich now? <laughs> I, I actually, I'm, I'm back in Boston. Um, I'm leaving again for London next week, but uh, I spend most of my time uh, in, in Europe, as, as Joe knows, mostly between the UK and, and, uh, and Spain. And uh, we also, uh, in a, I mean, London's sort of the headquarters for the fund. I spent a lot of time in Madrid, uh, primarily because uh, I work with a number of innovation groups there, including a foundation. Um, and then we have an entire team uh, that also oversees a number of other countries, including the Nordic and Baltic countries. Uh, so we have folks that are focused in uh, Nordics and Baltics, but based in Lithuania as well as, uh, as, well as Stockholm. Uh, so uh, again, our focus is Europe. So I'm, I'm usually over there two thirds of my time, but I'm very happy to be back in Boston. Um, how's the screen looking now? What does that uh, look like to you? It's looking like your PowerPoint screen now, yeah. not in presentation mode. I, I think if you go to the slide show and um, there's a setting there that, nope, we're still seeing the presentation mode. So in PowerPoint, if you go to the slide yep. show, and um, I think there's a setting to which monitor it'll appear on. Yeah, I think there is the problem, John. Yeah, so, so there's going. Uh, so because of that, we have a... Yeah, you're up on the, on the menu at the top slideshow? Yes, exactly. Okay. And is there a setting for... There you go. <clears throat> Did that work? It looks good to me. How about everyone else? Looks good. Running two different screens is the challenge more than anything. Um, good. So uh, let let me jump into this. Um, so the goal is to talk about business models, and and you know not like the old days, uh, business models are literally a living and breathing creature within organizations. Um, back in the old days, you could actually decide we're going to build watches, and our our model is going to be we're going to sell through retail channels, and that was your business model. Or we're going to sell cars and we're going to open a car dealership and build a partnership with Ford or Chrysler or someone else. And we're going to have a car dealership within this particular geography. Uh, but those business models have literally been exploded and they explode again and again and again uh, every few years, uh, which is quite fascinating. Uh, if you take a look at uh, sort of the definition of a business model, that has also changed. Um, uh, one definition that, that I particularly like is just a business model is a way uh, an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. Simple as that. How do you create? 
deliver and capture value, which ultimately is value for the end user. But it's very important to remember that successful companies have business models that allow them to fulfill client needs at a competitive price and sustainable cost. Once you slip and you don't do those things effectively, uh, ultimately the business is then threatened by competitors who are more novel and may even have inferior products. Um, so a business model, a successful business itself, must be willing to modify its model to adapt very, very quickly to the market. And we're seeing this all in our real lives on a regular basis, just as consumers. Um, when we think about sort of the, the components that come together as a business model, and, and I think about this through the lens, uh, not only as an entrepreneur that's built and sold companies and then uh, forced to modify, develop, change, modify, develop, and change business models. Uh, we may launch a product that was ultimately sold strictly through an in-house sales team. Uh, and then we want to enter a new region, such as Asia, as an example. And we may say, well, in this part of Asia, we want to have complete control. But in this part of Asia, such as, let's say, Japan, um, we need people on the ground that have deep experience. So let's hire a distributor. So the business model shifts from a direct sales model to a distribution model or to an OEM model. Um, so our ability to adapt to new markets and also to the changing climate within the market that our business is, is succeeding is critical. But at the end of the day, these three circles really must meld together. Uh, it's the value delivery, the value creation, and the value capture. Those three things must have harmony within the middle because if you're missing any one of those, ultimately you're going to lose consumers or you're gonna find it very, very difficult to sell into your market. And as we all know, when there's a gap in the market, there's entrants that will ultimately fill that gap and uh, those competitors will, will eat your business up. So touching upon sort of uh, how we think about the business versus the business model, um, when I talk to entrepreneurs and innovators and people that were either looking to invest in their company or I'm just working with them through an entrepreneurship program or, or through one of the incubators or innovation centers we support, um, very often they confuse uh, the business with the business model. Uh, we sell widgets, so we're going to sell through a distributor selling widgets. What they're not thinking about is, are, are, are the other variabilities in the market. So a business model needs to continually be innovated. And it's critical to develop a quality business that attacks new market, existing markets, and ultimately drives profitability. And many older businesses truly forget that. Uh, when you think about companies that have failed, companies that were literally stalwarts, they, they were around for decades and we scratch our head and say, geez, what ever happened to that company? I used to go there as a kid with my parents, or that's where we always purchased our whatever it was. It's primarily because their business model did not change. It wasn't necessarily that they were selling buggy whips and suddenly cars came into play. So their product was no longer useful. It may have been that their products were completely useful, but the consumer changed. Think about large retailers, especially retailers that have been impacted so much by COVID, uh, not just technology and the internet. Uh, so many retailers that have truly been dominant forces. Think about Sears, think about Macy's, think about Fry's Electronics on the West Coast. I mean, these were massive, powerful organizations. These companies sold exactly what we need. However, we still buy electronics. We still buy lawnmowers and tools. We still buy clothing, which is exactly what those companies offered. But we found a better way as consumers to buy them. And because these companies sat around the conference table hoping, hoping that something magical would change, uh, they were ultimately crushed by the Amazons and the other organizations. So the business must adapt to the ultimate needs of the consumers in order to be relevant or they will disappear. We all hear these you know, numbers, nine out of 10 firms fail, et cetera. What are the big reasons for failure? Um, you know, th this was a nice report that came out a little while back and 
as you can see here, is mostly businesses fail because of lack of market fit. That's a huge problem. And secondly, sort of their marketing positioning uh, becomes an issue. So if you look at just this one simple example, you're talking about marketing problems and lack of product market fit equals over 50% of the business failures. These are not companies that ran out of money. Money is not the problem in most cases, especially when you take a look at our market that we live in right now, where companies are raising, you know, in the United States anyways, you know, series A financing of tens of millions and series Bs of much larger numbers with fantastic valuations. When you look at the market capitalization of a lot of private companies, they've raised so much money privately um, that it's almost hard to imagine how their investors are going to get the money back when they go public. You take a look at a company like Chime, uh, one of my favorite examples of a great company in, in the, uh, the new banking world. Um, that company's last valuation on its private funding was over $15 billion. They're still not public. So companies don't always fail because they ran out of money. As, as much as people like to say that's the case, over 50% of companies fail because they just can't figure out the business model. They've got the wrong market fit or the wrong marketing strategy. Uh, here's a couple of examples that, uh, that, that might prove useful. Um, so just five examples of companies that uh, imploded over the past 12 to 18 months who had no problem raising money. Uh, Katara is, is one many of us know. I mean, certainly that is a company that uh, was very, very hot. It was probably the sexiest construction tech uh, company out there. Um, at one point, their market capitalization as a private company was over $4 billion, and they were listed as having about 8,000 employees. Okay? So you think about just those numbers. There's something about those numbers that make you say, well, these guys, they're going to be around a long time. Uh, they raised over $2 billion in capital, uh, and they evaporated in 2021. Uh, House Party, which I think a lot of us used for uh, entertainment purposes, education purposes. Uh, this was a company. It was fun, a great model. Uh, it once, at one point at their peak, they had 50 million new customers signing on every single month, which, which is just kind of whacked if you think about it. Uh, 50 million new sign-ons on a monthly basis. I mean, this is truly uh, a hockey stick kind of growth. Um, and they ultimately imploded as well. Fry's Electronics, which is, a, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I mean, this was, you know, one of these companies that people thought would be around forever. Uh, it literally lasted for decades. Uh, at their peak, they had something like 50 or in the high 30s number of stores. Uh, 20, um, I think it was 14,000 employees and two and a half billion in revenue. And you think to yourself, like, how, you can't go out of business if you have two and a half billion in revenue. You're literally doing two billion dollars, you know, I mean, two, 200 million, um, you know, on a monthly basis, every single month, you are generating hundreds of millions in revenue. Two and a half billion a year, where did they go? And ultimately, they could not, could not adapt quick enough to the market, and they were crushed by the likes of Amazon and other players that really just figured out, you don't need to walk into a 100,000 square foot store to buy a PC or to buy a memory device or to buy a new 22 inch monitor. Um, a few other quick examples, Katera is one. Uh, total market cap of Katera at its peak was uh, quite shocking. Um, uh, I mentioned that earlier. Um, the Quibi was the other one, which was another one that was very, very successful, over a billion market cap. So these are tiny examples of companies that had either very, very high market caps, massive revenues, huge numbers of employees, or some of them actually had all three, but they ultimately evaporated. And it wasn't because they ran out of money or couldn't raise money. Some of them were already public and could have easily continued to raise money on Wall Street through equity or debt financing. But Ultimately, the market demand just wasn't there. The investors look at that and say, yeah, you're getting crushed. Every year is a downward cycle. Uh, so uh, when I think about components of a business model 
and this is somewhat of a lens that that we as investors, you know, Great Valley Capital as a venture fund, and many of the venture funds that we part, partner with throughout Europe, the lens that we look through is not only is the you know team market you know market size etc., but it's also these fundamentals of the business model. Do they have a unique value proposition? Is their market segment actually strong, and do they have a winning uh, message? Um, is there a value chain structure that's in place, or is it just too expensive to sell this particular widget? Do they need to go through this distributor to this reseller to this partner, plus get governmental approval? If that becomes their structure in order to get a single unit sold, um, we just know that the, the, the odds are stacked against them, so there must be other benefits. Um, certainly their value uh, to essentially the network is if you think about every product, it's part of a network. Um, it ultimately has a family of other organizations part of its network. Who are the manufacturers, distributors, the assemblers? Where do they get their materials from? Whether it be software or it happens to be microchips or it happens to be some polymer that ultimately completes the product. You know, what is their value within that network? And soon as they don't play well within the network, they're ultimately going to have issues. Uh, I think supply chain issues are one that we're all familiar with right now, um, but those are the least of them. And then, of course, you know, revenue generation and margins uh, are absolutely critical, perhaps not in the beginning. Your business model actually may be that revenue generation is not really that important to us uh, in the beginning. And we're going to use a freemium model where installed base is how we're going to measure success. Um, but ultimately, sooner or later, you do need to actually generate real revenues and then hopefully margins after that. Um, and I think all of us can point to companies that uh, you scratch your head and think, gosh, how are these guys making money? Uh, maybe that isn't their vision right now. Maybe it's five years from now, they're going to start really making money. But what they were waiting for is that massive installed base uh, of committed users. Uh, and then the last two sort of pieces of it is, what is the competitive strategy? How are they actually lined up against the competitors? Uh, I think all of us, uh, certainly uh, at MIT and, and uh, many other very entrepreneurial organizations, you see the, the wonderful little chart that has the list of competitors, the features across the top, and then green boxes and red dots uh, where the company presenting usually has the most uh, green boxes. Um, where do you really fit within the competitive strategy? You, you can't win on every level. You can't say we are faster, better, cheaper, more profitable. You need to figure out where is our story? So if you're thinking about building a product, you guys are, are, are developing a medical technology that's going to be sold through large distributors. Uh, how are you thinking about your competitive strategy? Who else is trying to sell through those distributors? Are you creating enough margin that that distributor is going to make enough money that incentivizes their salespeople to sell your product? If not, maybe you wanna think about a different business model. Maybe you wanna think about going direct to the end user as opposed to going through a complex structure. Um, so the competitive strategy uh, is critical. And of course, the stage of development of the company, uh, a company that, has recently raised its Series A or its first financing is going to have an entirely different strategy, one would hope, than a company that's raised their Series D and has 100 million in the bank. So the stage development of the company is a critical component of how you think about your business model. I can't be a startup company with 12 people and 4 million in the bank and hire an international sales force, as an example. Uh, so just a little bit more detail there. Um, obviously, from a value proposition, you know, a description of what the customer's problem is, understanding the value of the solutions from that customer's perspective, and the market segment, who is that audience? Uh, from a standpoint of the firm's position, the value chain, as I said, you know, you have to think about not just we've built this wonderful widget, we've built this software application or this instrument or this particular um, uh, medical device as an example, and it's going to solve all the world's problems. The question is, how will your firm capture part of the value that it creates throughout the chain? Because you may be selling wholesale, um, and there's someone else that's selling retail, but the margins must make sense. 
So as an example, you know, I'm right now working on an IBM ThinkPad, uh, Lenovo or whatever it is called. Um, this is a piece of hardware that is very much direct to the consumer, whether it be they're selling to a business or they're selling to a consumer on their website and the, the, the machine shows up in my house or I can even walk into a retail business and pick up one of these. I can walk into Costco or Best Buy. Those are two entirely different business models. One is online. There needs to be a mechanism and an interface that allows me to customize my machine in such a way that I feel like it's mine. And then there needs to be a distribution and delivery channel that exists. Also on the retail side, I need to know that there's enough incentive and margins for that retailer to take up shelf space, to put my boxes on their shelf, train their employees to communicate about it. But there's another piece of this, which is beyond the hardware, there's a little sticker on my computer that says Intel inside. So Intel, last I checked, doesn't have any retail stores. You can't go to intel.com and, and order uh, you know, their own computer or your own microchip. Uh, I never walked by an Intel store in the mall. So Intel has an entirely different model, which is we are simply the brains inside of all of these machines. We don't want to deal with consumers. We don't want to set up retail shops. We don't want to have a, a user interface issue. We don't want to build an app. We're going to partner with and be the leader in the development of chips. And we count these hardware companies as our method to the market. So that's three different business models, direct to consumer through retail, direct to consumer online. And then the Intel example is an example of what would be considered an OEM model, sort of an original equipment manufacturer, where it is literally the Intel inside. So they partner with Dell, or they partner with Lenovo, and then Lenovo's responsibility is to sell the black boxes with the screen that has the Intel inside, and they get a check in the mail. So it's an entirely different model. So that flexibility is absolutely critical, which is what impacts, of course, revenue and margins. When I think back to um, a company I alluded to earlier, which was an MIT spin out uh, that was in the business plan competition, it was a company called uh, Molecular Wear. And this was a company, as I said, was building software for scientists. So it was in bioinformatics. Uh, we were essentially selling a number of products. One of them was the ability for scientists to look at massive amounts of data coming off of the instruments in their lab. So some of those things might have been, you know, pin tool robots, microarray scanners. Uh, the second piece of the data uh, of, of the product offering was the database that would store all of that. And then the third leg of the stool was the ability to do data mining. Uh, we had a direct sales team in the United States, but in other regions, we had to adapt certain or adopt certain models that work differently. So in parts of Asia, we had distributors. Um, we also built a partnership with a group on the West Coast that was building these scanning machines that would scan DNA from these microarrays. Um, and essentially, every time they sold an instrument, one of their scanners, uh, we got a check. It was simply, we were the Intel inside for them. So as the business grew, we had to adopt certain models that worked not only for the geography, but for the type of person or company that we were going to be selling to. Uh, and our margins, so to the top of this slide here, it changed dramatically from one to the other. Our margins when we were selling direct to an end user. So for example, one of our salespeople winds up selling to Novartis or to uh, the MIT you know, uh, Institute for you know, Biomedical Research. The margins were particularly high because they were paying a particular price for the instrument. All we had to do is pay sales costs and we delivered it. But our sales and marketing costs were probably higher than they would be if we had a distributor. So the distributor isn't going to pay retail price. They're not gonna pay what Novartis paid. They're going to pay a very discounted price, but our sales and marketing costs were zero. So as you all are thinking about 
whether it's starting a new company or working within an existing company, how do you think about attacking the market? It's not just about creating a new creative business strategy. It's thinking about how is this impacting my margins? How does this allow me to enter new markets? And how is this representative of how the competitors are operating? Um, finally, just competitive strategy. We talked a little bit about uh, one of my uh, favorite examples uh, of great business models is Netflix. This is a company that has literally um, changed the world um, from a standpoint of how we view um, uh, new entertainment uh, and content. Um, uh, you know, if we were in a in in you know ten years ago, uh, and any one of us wanted to uh, sit around the sofa with our boyfriend or girlfriend or family and watch a movie, uh, we would probably have a blockbuster membership. And we would go down to the Blockbuster, which would be located in one of the plazas uh, in some shopping center somewhere. Um, and we would walk in and wander up and down the, uh, the aisles and we would ultimately pick out a video or two. Uh, we'd bring it home, we'd keep it for the weekend and we had to have it back by a certain period of time in order uh, not to get the late fees. And that was a great model. It worked out well. And I'm probably talking maybe 15 years ago or more, uh, I'm dating myself. Um, and that was fantastic. It was incredibly convenient because it was a huge leap towards convenience versus putting the family in the car, driving to a movie theater, getting there at a specific time, you know, paying for the tickets, et cetera, et cetera. I was able to sit on my own sofa, eat popcorn and, and enjoy the movie. And Blockbuster was amazingly successful. The challenge is, of course, the business model was changing and they were not paying attention to this. Um, this company, Netflix, came up and they had an idea, which was, why on earth do we need to have millions and millions and millions of square footage of retail space around the country and compete with Blockbuster? We're just going to build a website and people can order their DVD. It'll arrive between one and three days and they can keep it for as long as they want. There's no late fees. Just that tiny shift in business model was transformational. So they were delivering in the mail, the thickness of an envelope was a DVD. So if you wanted to watch the most recent Star Trek movie, it arrived in your mailbox in 24 to maybe 72 hours. Keep it for a day, keep it for the weekend, keep it for a week, they didn't really care. They knew exactly where it was and they gave you a return envelope and you shipped it right back. And Blockbuster just slowly crumbled because of that fact. Because now I didn't need to leave my house. I just needed to be smart enough to plan a day or two in advance. And I could literally order five videos if I had that level membership. So they brought in an entirely new business model. Number one was subscription. So I bought a Netflix subscription that allowed me to get up to X amount of videos per month. Uh, number two, they eliminated the late fees, which was quite powerful because that's what kept most of us running back to the blockbuster on the corner uh, at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, because if you put your little video back in the box a little bit too late, you want to put a late fee. It also eliminated the inventory issue. Uh, many of us may remember that, well, maybe not many of us, but some of us will remember, um, you'd walk around a blockbuster, you were dying to find a movie you just read about, but they just didn't have it in stock. They only had six copies and it wasn't there. So you had to wait until it was there. Netflix eliminated that because they literally could burn a new DVD anytime they wanted to because of their relationship with the studios. So that business model transformed the way that we all watch movies at home. But Netflix wasn't finished. They then said, you know what, we're seeing a massive uptake in bandwidth. 15 years ago, it would have literally taken you two hours to download the latest Star Trek movie. Impossible. I mean, it would just take forever. It would also eat up half the bandwidth on your computer. Now, all of a sudden, bandwidth was exploding. And Netflix then modified their model to become literally downloadable and streaming, as we're all familiar with, and we take advantage of it today. How many of us download a Netflix movie before we get it on an airplane? And it's literally at your fingertips, and it takes up virtually no space on your computer. So there's a wonderful series of examples of not only a company that disrupted an industry, crushed its competition, 
then as technology changed, that company then morphed again into something else. And by morphing again into something else, you can imagine they, they're not burning DVDs anymore. Their cost to deliver you the movie is almost zero. If you have the bandwidth and you have the subscription, you get the movie. They do not have to have logistics, shipping, receiving, an entire massive team that's burning DVDs. So it's a phenomenal way that a company then changed. And then now, if we take a look at Netflix, over the past five years, it's become completely unrecognizable again. Netflix is not only able to deliver us the movies that we want produced by any distributor or uh, language, any particular production house, but it has become itself one of the most successful producers of TV shows, movies, mini dramas. It, it's absolutely mind boggling. No one could have predicted if you asked an actor or an actress 10 years ago, would you be willing to be in a TV series for a network that never existed before? The answer would be absolutely not. I'm going to do ABC, NBC, or CBS because those are the people that have the power to pay and also the network in everyone's homes. Netflix has changed the entire world because of that. So as the sign said here, which I think was located uh, right outside of San Francisco. Don't give up on your dreams. We started with DVDs. Um, think about also uh, some of our favorite uh, stores and shops. Amazon has pretty much almost no stores. Uh, when you think about it relative to its total impact on retail, uh, which is kind of mind boggling. Amazon, which is probably one of uh, the most disruptive companies ever in the lifetime of anybody paying attention to this, to this, uh, to this class. Um, they have upset every aspect of retail. And when you read about, you know, what Bezos essentially positioned the company as, um, his goal was to sell books. That was it. And the reason books made the most sense um, is for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, if he, if he ever walked into an investor's office and said, I want to create this website and we're going to sell books, but we're also going to sell cars. We're going to sell food. Um, we're also going to sell computers and we're going to sell TVs and, and phones and, and shit. We're going to pretty much sell everything. Um, he would have never gotten the company funded. But he was able to say, listen, this is a platform. We're going to sell books. You know why we're going to sell books? Eh, books don't expire. They don't go bad. <laughs> they have no shelf life. They're easy to ship. They're this big. I don't have any shipping problems. And people don't need to walk into a bookstore. They have this thing called the internet. They can research and read about books, but we're also going to help them research and read about books. And we're going to create a scoring model where people can actually communicate their feeling about a particular book and the reviews will be there. Who would have thought that in a very short period of time, if, if you look at the stories of the 90s, the 2000s, when Bezos was building this, that literally we can go on Amazon right now and buy anything, almost literally anything. And it doesn't even matter what country, what year, it can, it's absolutely incredible. And, and because of that, you've seen massive disruption in other businesses in those industries. Um, you know, not that long ago, I remember, uh, you know, walking into the Toys R Us on Boylston Street um, or, you know, the FAO Schwartz uh, in Boston that had the giant bronze teddy bear outside of it. And it was literally a legendary place you know, people brought their kids there. It would, people would take photographs outside. Uh, there, there used to be the giant toy store with the Ferris wheel sitting in Times Square. Those are all gone. And the reason is because I don't need to walk into a toy store and pay $49 for some cool plastic toy for my seven-year-old. I can just go on Amazon and pay $29 or $39 and it arrives at my door the next day. So the disruption of these companies is incredibly powerful. The ability to adapt the business model and change the business model is, is the reason that they survive. Um, everybody knows about these other options. I won't go through all of these. I want to be uh, cautious on time as well. Uh, but when we think about what it took to start a company years ago, if you were a taxi driver in Manhattan and you wanted to start your own taxi company, maybe have your own car or two, 
you you literally needed to buy a medallion. And a medallion, as some of you might know, is it's literally a piece of metal, but it gives you a very special license to pick up and drop off passengers within the confines of that particular city. And those medallions at one point were literally selling for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, per medallion. So people that had the ability to own 10 medallions, they, they literally had a corner on the market because there was a limitation in the number of taxis. That model was exploded because of people like Uber, who for the most part don't even own cars, um, are able to have vehicles everywhere they wish to have them. And they have been completely equipped to fight the unions and fight the cities and others who didn't want to adapt to those changes. Uh, so it's amazing to think a company could be that big and have such a small inventory. Think about Hertz or Avis. The inventory those companies are holding are literally billions of dollars of depreciating assets. Those cars are not going up in value. And those cars are literally serving zero people in times of like COVID because nobody's flying, nobody's stopping at San Francisco airport and picking up the Hertz rental car. But people still need to get across San Francisco. So what do you do? You want to call like Uber. It's there. It's waiting for you. It instantly shows up to your door and they have no inventory for the most part. Uh, Airbnb is probably the great example of this. Um, I would encourage you to, to take a look at Airbnb. It, it is mind boggling. Uh, how powerful that company has ultimately become and, and how many followers have also become very successful because of them. Uh, they have more bedrooms than the top three or four, I forget what the number is nowadays, largest hotel chains combined. And unlike Sheraton, which is owned by Marriott Bondway or Weston or the Hiltons, they're not sitting on hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate in every city, paying for that entire building, the staff, the heating, the air conditioning, the parking underground, the state taxes, the other things that come along with such a massive investment. Um, can you imagine that? Like they literally can sell a thousand hotel rooms in a given city, or I should say a thousand rooms in a given city. They don't pay any real estate taxes on that because they don't own the buildings. So these, these amazing models, not only are transformational, but they are representative of how companies are leveraging technology in order to completely change uh, new industries uh, and also old. Um, this is a great slide. I thought this was funny, especially uh, <laughs> for, for certain reasons on this. I thought it was a great example of just how long it takes for technology to be adopted. Um, think about the number of years it took for each product to gain 50 million users. Uh, it's pretty impressive when you think about the speed of technology. Uh, companies that were working in, you know, televisions or computers or even the internet, the adoption curve was really freaking long. Like you were waiting a long time for that adoption curve. But as the speed of things has changed, as companies have changed, as internet speed has changed, you can literally launch a new company, a new product on the internet or in other ways today and have a million users within a period of time that is just mind boggling when you think about the impact um, that, uh, that companies had 10 or 15 years ago. The idea of having a, a million subscribers is just mind boggling. Uh, now, you know, a new subscription service can open up and have a million subscribers in a relatively short period of time Whereas 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, you could launch a new publication, a new magazine, and you might be lucky to have 100,000 subscribers in the first five years. Uh, so think about the changing industry, think about how the competitors uh, continue to, to uh, move the market in really, really unique ways. And, and one of the, I was speaking with a group of, of entrepreneurs when I was in Madrid a few weeks back and before the holidays, and you know, one of the things they were talking about is the impact of COVID. And COVID is literally a great example of something that impacted the entire world. And those companies that were willing to adapt quickly are thriving today. And industries, a great example um, is in the medical technology field. Industries like medtech exploded 
if the company was willing to adapt very, very quickly. Just three, four years ago, I remember sitting in discussions at conferences and companies that had some sort of a remote patient monitoring device or technology or a teledoc model. We loved those things, but we were so concerned as our, our, were most people around, will the FDA approve this? Will this be approved by the insurance companies? What's the adoption curve? All of this, that changed overnight with COVID. Wouldn't a matter of minutes, your most old fashioned doctor's office, they were suddenly scheduling all of their regular appointments by telephone or by Zoom call. And now your regular doctor's appointment very often is remote, unless you truly need to physically be in that doctor's office. So companies that are looking at the future and can change is one thing, but also having a management team that can modify their strategy based on a surprise, a massive change in the market, an economic downturn, a pandemic, also are the most powerful. And there's companies that have thrived incredibly during this period of time and other ones that have been totally crushed. Uh, to kind of change, uh, uh, I guess, channels uh, a little bit. Um, fundraising is obviously critical to all of your startups. Um, and when we take a look at the markets over the past couple of years, the markets have been so buoyant. It's absolutely incredible. It doesn't matter whether they're in the U.S. and Europe. Money is pouring into companies. This is a snapshot of just you know the 10 largest IPOs of 2021. And you think about just the amount of capital and the market capitalizations um, of some of these companies. And these are just IPOs. This doesn't include private capital being raised in the, in the billions, billions and billions. And it doesn't even include the, the trend in SPACs. Um, so these SPACs, which are special purpose acquisition corps, um, these SPACs essentially have uh, been around, most people think they're new, but they've actually been around for, for decades, um, but they go in and out of favor. Um, right now you have a number of companies that have gone public uh, more than you can count um, just through the SPAC process. So, so finding capital isn't necessarily the issue. I don't wanna say it's easy. You know, it requires a lot of the boxes to be checked, but finding capital for your business shouldn't be that difficult. The ability to deploy that capital and make sure that you can survive is absolutely critical. Um, so I'm gonna summarize a few things here and, and Justin for someone on time. Uh, this, is a, this is sort of a philosophy that, that I was taught when I was in the early parts of my career, which is if you can't measure it, it probably doesn't matter. Um, you need to measure what's happening in your business. You need to be able to measure whether that means that your business is measuring success based on revenue. Um, revenue is one, one measurement, right? But so is profitability. Um, another measurement might not include either of those. As I said earlier, maybe the way you measure the success of your business is number of downloads. Uh, how many people have it, you know, downloaded the product? How many users do we have? How many recurring users do we have versus people that download it and delete the app? You need to be able to measure uh, what's happening in your business on a regular basis. And, and if you do that effectively, you're going to see trends that will allow you to continually enhance your business model. Because if suddenly you are shifting as a business to there's a new measurement of success, maybe revenue, maybe your investors are pressuring and saying, listen, you know, you've got X amount of users, you just raised a certain amount of capital, and now we need to be moving towards profitability. Having the measurements in your back pocket is critical as you change your business model in order to continually succeed based on whatever metric your company uses as a, sort of a barometer of success. Um, this book from John came out uh, a number of years ago. Uh, John Doerr is uh, quite famous. Many of you may know him. He is one of the people from Kleiner Perkins Caulfield Buyers, one of the most famous venture capital firms in the world. Um, uh, his early career, he worked with Andy Grove at Intel. And uh, Andy had this methodology called OKRs. Um, and this allowed him to think of his organization and each of the team members, each of the management people uh, were rated and scored based on uh, these, these OKRs, which are objectives, key results. And uh, 
I met John uh, a number of years ago, um, actually at a climate reference conference uh, in California. And uh, he was talking about this model that he's brought to all of the companies he's invested in, whether it be Google or others. And it's been incredible, uh, the impact that it's had on those teams. Uh, so it's one of my favorite books. We give it to all of our CEOs. Um, and many of them uh, have uh, used this not only for their own sort of measurement of success, but also for their team management team. Uh, and what you measure uh, is absolutely critical for the success of your business. And what you're measuring today might be a lot different than what you're going to measure two years from now. Uh, I'm going to sum things up uh, as uh, giving you examples um, of things to measure. Uh, this is a fun chart uh, I've used before. Um, we talked about measuring success based on downloads of revenue and profitability. One way to measure success is actually revenue per employee. Um, it might not be the smartest way to measure success for a particular business. Um, so for example, uh, a company that sells, you know, a $20 million box, you know, to the government to, to manage satellites, um, their revenue per employee is going to be a lot different than a uh, company that is building the next great travel app. So each business is going to be different. Uh, the revenue per employee doesn't necessarily mean more revenue per employee equals a more successful company, but there is a correlation here, as you could probably tell. Um, if you take the total number of employees of a company like Apple, and I think this is slightly out of date, um, you imagine total number of employees divided by revenue, the average employee, regardless of what they're making, is creating about 1.9 million in revenue if you just took that simple metric uh, versus let's say Alphabet, uh, Google, about 1.3, pretty, pretty serious. Uh, a company that might be very uh, focused in uh, transactions, the number might be completely different. Uh, PayPal was about a half a million uh, in value per employee. Well, that's quite impressive. I mean, they have some employees that are making 5 million a year, but they also have some employees making 75,000 a year. So maybe this is a metric that's important to your business. I don't know. Uh, each company, each industry is a little bit different, uh, but it's one measurement. Uh, uh, another fun example was this chart that talked about, you know, uh, what are the most profitable companies per second? I thought this was cute. I don't think it serves any value, uh, but it, it is damn entertaining. Uh, and uh, you can see what companies literally earn the most amount of profit per second over the course of the work year. Um, it's a lot of fun. I would not advise any of my CEOs to, to measure this, but uh, it's, it's great to look at and you can see some industry trends there. Uh, so just simply to summarize and then open up any Q&A, um, think about your value proposition in your market segment. Where does it matter? Uh, if you're selling you know, uh, $25,000 Piaget watches or IWC watches, you have an entirely different value proposition in market segment than somebody selling a Swatch watch um, or a, uh, you know, a, a watch that's for runners um, or the Apple watch, entirely different. Uh, think about the value chain structure. Uh, how on earth do I get my product to the right people? And that answer is going to differ based on the price of your product, the product you're selling, the geography you're selling to, et cetera. Um, which also falls into the value within uh, the network. Uh, revenue generation and margins are one standard of measurement as we talked about. Your competitive strategy and your stage of development as a company is also highly relevant. So um, these are some of the key things uh, that you have to think about. And uh, I wish we had more time to, to chat about this, but I'll open it up to questions now and, and, and thank you all for listening. And do we have any uh, questions? No questions in the chat yet, but please okay. feel free to raise your hands and ask questions or add it to the chat. Rich, them. I, I had a, a couple of slides. I wonder if I could put up to sort of have you comment on. I gotta say, I love some of the comments here. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> um, all right, here, here's one I love. Um, I guess Bumble is another representation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> um, yes, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, a friend of mine, Brad Bell, who entrepreneur turned venture capitalist, uh, I remember years and years ago, uh, he drew the, the triangle of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. 
uh, which you know usually food and shelter ranks as the top. Um, and uh, in, in his case, the, the top was Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, was at the top for those of us who know what it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of great comments here. Thank you all. Uh, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I wonder if I could share, um, I, you know, and try to illustrate a, a little more practical. I mean, what you said is absolutely correct. Um, I have a little example of va different value chains that might cast a little bit of light on how you think about business models. If, if I could show a few slides if, and have you That'd make a comment. Yeah, so I guess, let's see, do you have to stop sharing or can I take over here? Um, I think you can, uh, huh. yeah, I okay. can pause share. Okay, and wait a second. All right, let me get this started. Whoops, come on. All right, where, where in the world? <laughs> where in the world? Uh, the, the problem with Zoom. Yeah, here we go. Uh, which one am I looking at? Here, let me start that again. There we go. So everything, people like food, right? So if, if you create a value chain for food, a simple one might be, you know, you've got everything from people making seeds all the way up to you know, ending up in your supermarket and you prepare the food and that's dinner for tonight. But, you know, there's another way. Oh, I guess I have to click this through. Sorry, I forgot it was animated. Okay, so we're going to have dinner tonight. One way, one value chain is if you're in the business would be this. But, you know, we know supermarkets have low gross margins, right? That's why they put all the stuff at the checkout. So some supermarkets said, well, you know, what if we were to, prepare some meals. You could pick up when you're in the supermarket, you take it home and you eat at home. Now that's a totally different business model and it requires different resources. You need, you need re recipes, you need people packaging, you need someone to prepare them and cook. But it, it effectively conveys carrots at you know, $2 a pound into you know, much more expensive because you pay a lot for the convenience. And then if you sort of continue this, then you got, well, of course there's a restaurant, could always go out and uh, eat at a restaurant. Um, but what if somebody said, hey, I could deliver from the restaurant and expand the um, market for that restaurant, and that's, you know, Grubhub or a delivery service. Totally different set of things needed to do it, different economics. But at the end part is a meal tonight. And then, of course, you've got the, well, maybe people like to cook at home. And I could plan and package and ship and deliver and you could cook it there. These are all basic models around people eating dinner tonight with vastly different uh, economics, resource requirements, culture, the whole bit. And I, any, any comment about this way of presenting it? Um, I mean, just from my side, I, it is quite fascinating because it wasn't that long ago that you basically had two models. And model one was that you took the family out to eat. And model two is that you went to the supermarket, bought food, ingredients, and then you went home and cooked it. Um, delivery was something that uh, companies like Domino's really actually perfected. And they were really one of the first to, in a very large scale, uh, deliver things to your house. Um, but the problem was there was no there was no internet and there was also no apps at the time. Uh, so you had to call Domino's or a local pizza place and they would send a car to your house and you know get, get your pizza that was usually cold. Oh, uh, there was one one company in the middle there said, well, you could fax your order in. You know that was a big yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was a big advance over the telephone. You know, just fax yeah. it in. <laughs> And then, uh, again, harnessing technology, you ultimately then created, you know, the delivery apps that uh, now I, I don't need to be limited to Domino's delivery. I can mm -hmm. I can get delivery from literally the French restaurant down the corner uh, yeah. that, that doesn't that, you know, does take out occasionally. Um, so I, I think that these, are, these are great examples of ways a particular service or product has actually matured over time. Yeah. Um, the, the, the other component of this to think about is the, the fact that um, all of it originates with the seed manufacturers, seed distributors, and the farmers. 
Mm -hmm. um, that has not changed. Um, they actually uh, have have not been disintermediated by technology um, because population grows, people need to eat. Simple as that. However, any of the other folks in the early part of the value chain, which are the supermarkets and also the uh, the restaurants, uh, they have been greatly impacted by this uh, yep. because if if I'm uh, Grubhub uh, or Blue Apron, I'm not paying retail price actually um, for uh, that particular product. Blue mm -hmm. Apron is negotiating wholesale prices for its products, then it delivers it to your house ready to cook. And Grubhub is actually reducing the profits of the restaurants um, by charging that fee. So it's it's incredible that cer certain people in your value chain here have, have uh, had to adapt and change. Um, other ones uh, have been uh, unscathed uh, by this. And, and you know, there are other models. That, speaking of the left side of the of the value chain, the the farm to table thing basically cuts out all those middle people, the wholesalers, and connects directly with farmer. You know, the, the organic farms, etc. And and I had read in New York City during the pandemic where you couldn't eat and they couldn't. Some did take out, but some of the more um, favorite uh, neighborhood restaurants, say in the West Village, were actually packaging up uh, ingredients with the recipes that you used to like to enjoy at the particular bistro. Uh, and again, trying to figure out how to keep the kitchen. And in fact, even restaurants now, they have uh, ghost restaurants, right? Where it's all fulfilled out of a warehouse. Uh, so, yeah, so all different kinds of business models. So anyway, I thought, Thought that might be helpful to people. I'll, I'll stop sharing though. <laughs> Richard and Joe, we've got a few questions just about that conversation you were having, and we also have some more general questions for Rich in general. Okay. Um, so um, there's one about um, from from when you were talking about the business models um, for markets. Said, would this business model work for the regions where wet markets are the norm? From Helen. Um, how do you define wet markets? Uh, are you talking about in the food sector? Helen, if you're comfortable unmuting yourself and, and speaking to your question, that'd be great. Yes, yeah, so what I mean by wet market is uh, is more similar actually to the farmer's market as it's commonly seen in the US or Europe. So yeah, so basically farmers, individual farmers, they bring their uh, produces to the market and people just to congregate there to not only buy food, but also have some kind of like a social conversation. And those things happen every day, not just on weekend. Hmm. Excellent, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, so the, the question, now that I know what a wet market is, uh, as it relates to that, what was the question again? So my question is, uh, would this kind of uh, pick and choose and delivery model work in place in regions where wet markets are the norm, where wet markets serve not only as a transactional space and also, but also as a social space? Yeah, very cool question. Um, my, my gut instinct and sort of uh, intuitive sort of instinct is that um, because uh, a wet market or even a farmer's market, um, it, it is generally an incredibly low tech atmosphere and it serves other purposes. Uh, so for example, if I go to the farmer's market in London, that's there every single Saturday uh, near Covent Garden, um, I've got farmers there. I can pick up fruits, vegetables, fish, steaks, all of these things. The, the most technology they have within that environment is the ability to take my credit card um, on, on their phone. Um, the likelihood they're going to be disintermediated is very slim because there, there's, there's such an emotional connection to actually seeing the, the farmer or the retailer or the fisherman standing there with his fresh lobster in his hand. Um, so I think that there are, are some subsets within an industry called the food industry or the restaurant industry or whatever you might call it, um, that uh, at some level, they, they thrive and succeed in spite of technology, um, but they're also highly fragmented. And, and maybe that's the key thing to think about is 
these are highly, highly fragmented markets. Think about the flower bazaar that happens in your town on every Sunday in the South End. I mean, can you disintermediate that? Maybe. I mean, sure, I can go on to ftd.com or, or whatever the latest, but at the end of the day, there's an experience to be had of buying from a fresh bakery or a fresh florist. And it, it's such a highly fragmented market that the consumer is engaging in that experience for a different reason. If you want convenience, that would not be the place to buy your flowers. You would call the local market, they would deliver in three hours. But if you enjoy the experience of dealing with those retailers and those vendors, uh, I think they're going to be there for decades to come. Well, and you, you can think of, you know, think of uh, Starbucks. I mean, yes. that's an experience as much as, as the coffee. So, you know, could markets brand themselves and, you know, or would that destroy, the, that's a whole culture issue. Would it destroy the whole vibe of a farmer's market to say this is a chain of farmer's markets? You know, you could play with it. But the, the point, it also, these business models affect the culture. You know, what is the culture of the company that's delivered? That when you set up the model, it defines what's important in the, in the company. And, um, and also the culture affects the business model. I mean, there, right. are, there are places throughout Europe that they will not allow a Starbucks into their little village yep. for, under any circumstances. Uh, right. Because... It, it, it's, it's, it's not that the Starbucks feels different than the local coffee shop with the leather sofas and people chatting. It's because it is a retail brand. It's international. It's viewed as a big box. Um, there, there's many places around the world, especially in Europe, that you know they don't want to do anything to hurt that small business that's been loyal to them making coffee for 30 years. And uh, you know, similar to the farmers markets. Right. I'm going to just try to keep a time check here because we want to do the breakout rooms. Um, can we maybe do one other question and finish up? We and... have quite a few that have been waiting. I did put another question oh. there just because of the whole set, but it's, it's, of course, it's up to you. We have one from um, Luciana or Luciana. Um, she, she Luciana. Luciana. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Luciana from Brazil. And uh, I have a question, and one of my students, we have a 14-year-old here, it's very late in Brazil, and she's awake because we were supposed to come to the States next week to attend the Harvard, Modern United Nations, and when we heard that uh, the lecture that would be on campus, it was her dream to visit the campus, and it's now online, we are not able to visit, but at least we can stay up too late and watch. And one of the questions is regarding the, with so many changes uh, happening uh, all around the world because of COVID. And we see that there are many business, many ventures coming up. And one of the things that I have noticed is the whole thing um, about the ESG and everyone is so worried and that we know we must take it in, into account. but. How do you see it relevant to when we are thinking about new ventures and new business models to take ESG into account or how large that venture needs to be to connect with the ESG in the moment that we are living in? Do you think that it's, it's something that we must take into account or what is it that we really need to weigh in? when considering a new venture in a post-pandemic uh, context? Great question, Luciana. And, and uh, um, it, it is really fascinating. I, I was recently asked to speak uh, at an event in London that was specifically about the impact on venture capital and startups associated with ESG. And this was to a group of family offices. Um, and uh, my, my remarks there will be exactly what I'm going to share with you now, which is I think that the concepts of ESG um, should be incorporated into the business um, in the way that it makes sense for the company itself. Um, people use ESG as sort of just as if it all goes together. Quite frankly, it doesn't. Um, uh, you know, ESG, as we all know, or as most of us know, is sort of it stands for environmental, social, and governance. And if you're an oil, gas, or mining company, the E is really, really big. 
right? Like if you're a startup thinking about developing smart city applications, well, E is shit, that's big, right? Like that's big. If you're a, a company that is developing a, a new dating app or a travel app, well, the E is probably really, really small. And maybe the S might be relatively big because you're trying to have a social impact. You're trying to introduce people to new parts of the world. You're trying to bring economy uh, and, and capital to new markets. Um, so I think that each of those have to be thought about in relative terms, depending on the company that, that you're building. Um, so for example, you know, we're a pan-European venture fund. Um, in our case, the S and the G are really, really big. Um, the S being the social piece which is that our goal is to impact new markets, impact people, actually invest in healthcare and things that actually have impact. Uh, and the G is super big. Um, and the G is the governance piece. And uh, the G sort of uh, falls into a couple of categories. Number one, uh, we're very big on the diversity piece. Uh, most of our team is actually women. We, we specifically um, pay extra attention to companies that have serious diversity in the founding team, the board member, et cetera. Um, not just because we're super good people. Uh, of course we are, but uh, the truth is you get better returns. The bottom line is diverse teams provide better returns. These are smarter teams. These are smarter and better board discussions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on a number of boards right now. One of them is a, is a public company in the US. I mean, the debates we have at the board are awesome. I mean, we have, we have this woman, Lisa, uh, Lisa Borders, who she, she used to be the president of the Women's NBA. I mean, what a different view and great set of, of discussions that we have. Um, so for us, the S and the G are super big, the E is not so big. Um, so I think it's an awesome question. Do you need to think about ESG? Absolutely. Should you think about each of those uh, equally? Absolutely not. Um, so thank you very much for your question. And if you guys do make it to the US, uh, uh, I'm sure Joe or I could find somebody that can give you a great tour. Of, uh, we Antarctica. are. We are actually leaving on uh, Sunday, just because we need to be taking PCR COVID tests every second day. But we are coming, yes, on Sunday. Great. Um, any other uh, really quick rapid fire questions um, that we, we should use? Here. We have one from Giovanna in the chat. Uh, and I know also um, Amy has raised her hand, too. Um, Giovanna, if you want to unmute yourself, but otherwise I'm happy to read out your question. So Giovanna's question, oh, there you go. You unmuted yourself. Oh, okay, so um, I wanted to ask, besides having an organized team that, can, that doesn't have any fights among themselves, what is the best way to model your business accordingly with the changes of the world, like the pandemic, so that like, the company can surpass others and continue succeeding in different conditions of the world? Um, I mean, very broad question. I think my, my, my thought is two things. One is um, uh, make sure the company is well capitalized to, to survive downturns. Um, but having a, uh, a, a diverse group of talent around the company is critical. Uh, when I think of, of startups that have faced challenges, pandemics being uh, just, uh, just one example that we're all familiar with, but other challenges, downturns in the market, competitive landscape, currency challenges, um, it's because they can look at their team and see the diversity within the team and actually get new ideas. And, and one of the things that, that we love to see with early stage companies is that, you know, you, you can only, as a small company, you can only afford to hire so many people and, you know, really really talented, very experienced people uh, are very expensive. Get those people on your board of directors, get them on your board of advisors, get them as a sounding board for you uh, where there's a mentor-mentee relationship and, and you'll be amazed at the challenges that you'll be able to navigate. Um, that'd be my initial thought. Trying to move quickly on these questions. Thanks so much, Rich. Um, if we have time, We've got one more question, but otherwise, <laughs> or others can stay back and ask more questions as we break out into the rooms. It's up to you. Sure. Yeah, Rich, normally we would hit the breakout rooms now. Perhaps what we can do is do the breakouts. Could you stay on for a few minutes and people that aren't going to the breakout rooms, I think we could 
continue in the main session with questions. Is that right? Okay. Absolutely. Sounds good, Joe. Uh, I'm here for as long as you need me. So just let okay. Me know. All right. So why don't we head off to breakout rooms and plan to come back maybe at 7.35 Eastern. That's like in what? A few. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, stay behind if you want to ask Rich a, a question. And okay, who's who's in charge of breaking us out? There we go. Um, so same as yesterday, uh, for people who have already been pre-assigned, uh, you're going to be sent to the breakout rooms. But then for people who haven't put in their preferences, feel free to click the breakout room option, scroll to the very bottom, and join whichever topic is interesting for you. Um, just like yesterday, I can't see a breakout room option in the bottom of my screen. Yeah, the same for me. Do you see it under the more tab? So there's a three dots and there's more. Uh, let me do it. Let me try to do it. I don't have a more tab on my screen. Okay, I think we're going to give it another. No, it's not here. Yeah. Yesterday it was, it, it popped up. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. today it hasn't yet. Give it a 40 second. One moment. Okay. Set out a moment for me in a room, even though I actually want to ask Richard a question. <laughs> okay, well, you can come back to the main session <laughs> or go ahead and ask your question. And, and if and if you disappear, come on back. <laughs> yeah, so Richard, um, there's a couple of us commenting in the chat, and I wanted to ask you so, what do we do for those people who in the more regulated industry uh, who tend to have? Health cycle, uh, you know, whether it's a financial industry or healthcare industry. In our particular case, we're building an AI telehealth platform to bridge eye and health. And so, uh, our, our eventual business model ideally is insurance reimbursement. And we all know <laughs> insurance reimbursement takes time, right? Um, uh, especially for more uh, integrated medicine. So I understand what you expressed as sort of a, the model, you know, so thinking about regulated industries, you're in the AI healthcare space um, and reimbursement's uh, a piece of this. Um, what's, the, what's the primary question? Is it, is it the Sorry, business? Sorry, I just put it in the break room. <laughs> you got stuck in a break room, all right. <laughs> uh, so she's back, okay. Back to the break, break loop. Anyway, so the question is like, you know, with industry with long sales cycle, right? Like you have, you know that the best successful business model for us will be insurance reimbursement, right? So that we can maximize, you know, op opportunity for the, all the beneficiaries, right? While we're getting there is a long sales cycle, right? So we have looking into B2B sales directly to like healthcare companies or elder centers, or even opening up to B2C. It's like say, um, copying similar to Webby Parker, Tamshi's model, where we can still reach out to patients because anyone knows a patient, right? So one healthy user joined the platform, they could sponsor a patient, right? We even have this crazy idea, like, can a corporate wellness program sponsor an elder center, <laughs> you know, for the, for the programs? And so what do you do with company like us, who's in more like a regulated industry with like long sales cycles? Yeah, so, so this is a challenge we run into a, a, a lot because we do we deal with healthcare. We we have a fintech company in the UK uh, that's in a highly highly regulated environment, and their environment is is complicated by the fact that they're in the UK, uh, and many of the UK regulations ha have not transferred uh, since Brexit into other parts of Europe. Um, in the healthcare space, you've got two issues, right? One is uh, you have regulatory, and then you have reimbursement. Um, so you may have a new product. The question is, uh, does it need regulatory approval? And if it does, do you meet those standards? So let's assume that you meet those standards or it doesn't need it, right? So for example, uh, you know, a, a product might need uh, a regulatory approval, uh, like a 510K, uh, like a diagnostic test, um, or it may not. Um, you know, many of us can buy supplements uh, walking into the local Walgreens or CVS, and that doesn't require regulatory approval. And reimbursement is the other piece. So do you actually need to have a third party pay for the product or service? Um, so if, if I'm selling a diagnostic test, there is someone that's paying for that. It's either consumer 
uh, right? Which is, you know, if I'm selling a birth control test and I can buy it off the shelf at CVS, well, there's no reimbursement issue. The consumer's paying cash for it. Um, if I'm selling a new technology for MRI, well, that needs to be in a hospital environment and it needs to be reimbursed. Um, so think about how you measure those cycles, right? One is regulatory reimbursement and then sales cycle is a whole different thing. Um, what I found often is companies that have multitude of options. Um, what you want to do is you want to find a comparator in the market. Who is it that you most admire and what about their business model or the top two companies in the market? What about their business model can you adopt? So for example, 23andMe, right, which we're all very familiar with, um, you know, essentially this is a, a unregulated uh, sort of model but at the state level, in other words, it's unregulated at the FDA level, but at the state level, it's regulated because there's rules around transportation of samples and things of that nature. Um, they're able to sell direct to consumer and the consumer pays for it. So they do not have a sales cycle issue, nor do they have a reimbursement issue, but they do have some regulatory concerns versus other uh, medical devices or technologies where you need reimbursement doctors and everything else involved. Um, so as you think about choosing the right business model, I would think about who are the top two companies that are most relevant. I don't know enough about your business to, to really speak intelligently about, about this, but um, who are the companies that are most similar or who do you aspire to be? What can you borrow from their business models? And then think about it through the lens of which one should we test first? Right? Because there's never a binary answer, do this or do that, right? It, you know, you could be Dell Computer and sell 99.9% .9 of your products online, or you could take an interesting approach like Apple and open retail stores, right? It, it, there's not a good answer or a bad answer. Both are very successful companies. Um, what does your business, remember one of the things we talked about in our slides was the stage of development of the company. Well, if, you, if you've just raised a seed financing of three million and you have nine employees, that might be a different decision than when you raise your series C of 70 million, right? And you have a full team. So who do you admire in the industry? Whose business models can you borrow from? And also what makes sense today based on our current capitalization structure? If, if you're sitting on one, years of capital, one year of capital in the bank, you probably don't want to choose the business model that has an 18 month sales cycle. Because your goal is not to make your business instantly successful. It's, it's, it's an iterative process, right? No one sets out to run a marathon by running 26.2 miles. They, they say, you know what, I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to run to the corner. And then the next day I'm going to run to the corner twice. And then I'm going to enter a 5k and a 10k. And I think for businesses that are trying to move too fast, that, that becomes an issue. So who do you admire, respect? What models can you learn from and what's appropriate for your company today? Get to a milestone that drives value, then reset that and do it again. Yeah, so as a follow-up question, I guess, um, so like our example of the company we, um, we could copy their model is actually Silver Sneaker, which got the most insurance reimbursement for an outdoor fitness company, right? Like their, I think their revenue is 133 million uh, annual revenue, and this is considered low during COVID. Um, so, but there's also Paraton, and we kind of like the Paraton for the underserved, which is <laughs> a directly B2C model, right? Um, and how do you as an outsider, you can't really see the secret sauce of like, oh, how does Silver Sneaker got the insurance reimbursement? How did they figure that out, right? And so even though their model could be the most successful model for us. And then the, the other question is like, you know, when you calculate your model, I like the timeline thing, but when you calculate the model, like, you know, like, like say for example, um, at a reimbursement program, you could get average $50 per 15 minutes, so $200 per hour. If you only do a fitness program, that might be what $15 per hour for you know a user to pay you, right? So so how do you balance that like you know the, the margins um versus yeah. the timelines? Yeah so, so let me answer that quickly and then make time for other questions. I think that um 
the 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 decision is driven by how your company measures success. If your investors are measuring success based on total top end revenue, and your model is Silver Sneaker, which is a, a great app for online classes, and that's what your investors want you to push, you, you better drive top end revenue, right? You better have absolutely world class uh, level of classes, options for people, and they actually are committed. That way, you don't have to continually resell to the, you know to the consumer. You have you have a your annual recovering revenue. Um, if if your investors are driving you as a company towards number of downloads and revenue doesn't matter, um, it's an entirely different model. Um, I mean, Silver Sneaker is an app. I mean, Peloton's an entirely different ball game, right? Because they're both a hardware software solution, and I mean, they're they're Silver Sneaker would not have Peloton on. Uh, their competitive landscape, right, uh, list. Um, and Peloton wouldn't have it on there. So make sure you understand exactly who you're competing against and how do you measure what's important. And it's okay. not the same for every company. You know, th three app companies in the healthcare space might have completely different business models driven by how much capital they have, how they're approaching the market, who do they want to be in three years, the timeline for their investors. You know, if their investors are looking for a very quick exit, Maybe the model there is different than somebody who's patient. Other questions? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yes, I believe Wasil is next. Wasil, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. No, no worries, it's Wasil. I, I doubt you know we'll have enough time, but this is my question is a slightly different cut on the healthcare side. So right now in the medicinal psychedelic industry, there's a questionably low number of top VCs. Um, in the space, investing in companies. And so I think that's pushing existing companies to go public for capital. And so from an investor perspective, with a new industry such as medicinal psychedelics, which is showing strong indicators of a new paradigm altogether in mental health, how do you determine from an investor uh, perspective, um, how and when to get into a company or invest in a company in this space? This is, this is funny. Um, so uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, but we invested in a psychedelics company. <laughs> so, so I actually love this space. And, and when I talk to them about it <laughs> with friends, they think I'm on psychedelics um, because <laughs> they're like, what did you invest in? Do they sell marijuana? I'm like, no, nothing to do with, you know, uh, uh, marijuana shops or, or dis you know, distiller or distribution of, of such. Um, so psychedelics is a very interesting area. Um, uh, so I, I guess your question is sort of twofold. Uh, one is, I guess, an opinion around that particular industry, but also how, as an investor, do we determine when it's time to get into a particular new market? Um, so two things. Number one, we're a growth stage investor. So we invest later stage. So we want to see companies with traction. So we're not the first money in. We're not going to invest in your science project out of Cambridge University that has like three PhDs and a whole bunch of cool ideas. There's too many good investors doing that that are much smarter than us. Uh, so, so when we make investment decisions, there's a lot of criteria, um, in, in, including who else is in the round, um, what do we see as the potentiality. For something like the psychedelic space, we also have to take into consideration a couple of other factors. Um, uh, you know, the, the prior question, uh, questions actually were, were quite, quite good because we have to also think about uh, regulatory and reimbursement and governmental change, right? Um, so, you know, the regulatory environment might actually crush that, a particular industry. You have to be very careful of that and go in with open eyes. Um, so we, we invested actually along with Peter Thiel uh, in the Series D um, we did a secondary offering. I won't get into the details of it, but we invested in a company called Atai, A-T-A-I, that, that you probably know. Some people may not. Um, they're, the, they're the leaders. They, they are the leaders. And part of the reason that we found uh, them interesting to invest in, and it wasn't because of Peter Thiel, who was, I mean, I, I've never met him. Um, so I, I don't know if he has any expertise in, in, in that field. It, it was the fact that there were really smart investors in the deal, number one. Number two, they were a major owner and some of their founding team came out of Compass Pathways, which 
was considered the leader. And when I talk to people I, I know in, in the world of research, which I spent a lot of my time in, in the healthcare space, they really respected Compass Pathways. And, and leadership and technology from Compass Pathways was moving into a tie. A tie was an ownership uh, piece into Compass Pathways. So, so essentially, um, the way uh, I'm answering your question is to say, number one, we, we invest later stage and we need to see that the dots connect. Right, like I wouldn't invest in a company because Peter Thiel invested in it, nor would I invest in a company that was in a new trendy area that seemed sexy. But if I can connect enough of those dots, it all makes sense at that point. I've got very smart investors like Peter and a whole bunch of other smart people. I've got assets that are highly recognized in the industry, hence the product that came from Compass Pathways. I've got management team and leadership that came from Compass that are founders in a tie. And this is an area where the government regulatory bodies are still undecided, which creates some risk, but they are not creating, and this was another concern of ours, is, is they are not creating um, consumer level um, psychedelics, right? They are focused on developing psychedelics and also using the whole world of, of uh, sort of microdosing um, in order to treat diseases that were important to us. So they are focused right now as an example in the area of depression. And if you think about disorders like depression, uh, I mean, these are not singular issues, right? These are things that affect the entire society, right? They affect people's ability to live a happy life, to, to work effectively. Um, so I think it was a number, uh, as I can said earlier, sort of dots that connected for us. Um, I think long-term, that's gonna be a very big industry. I think it's going to continue to evolve. There's gonna be winners and losers. Uh, I don't know if we've picked a, a winner uh, or not, but um, you know, I think about some of these things, uh, you know, I like to collect art and, and the type of art I like is contemporary and modern, but there's a particular type of art that's called pointillist. And George Surratt was one of the key people in the world of pointillist art. And when you walked up to one of his paintings and if you stood very close to a Surratt painting, it was nothing but a whole bunch of dots. And you were like, I, I just don't see it. It's a whole shitload of dots of different colors. But when you stepped back, it was an image of three women holding umbrellas by a stream two sitting on blankets and a horse and carriage driving by. So sometimes you have to have the perspective to see the dots, to see the image. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. Um, but if the dots connect, we're more likely to invest. George Surratt, I will remember as a good uh, example for this answer. Thank you. Uh, Rich, just we're, we're gonna bring people back from breakout rooms in about four minutes. All to right. start the second part, so just uh, give you a little time frame there. All right, good. So we have four minutes if there's any other questions. Mal, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, my question is more about planning for like innovation and sustainability over time. You gave the example of Netflix and sort of starting out with DVDs and then sort of they obviously completely pivoted and now they have this whole digital platform. Um, so I'm curious if there are certain standards around like timeframes that, uh, you know, this can be startups or sort of places along down the line, like timeframes in which like massive sort of institutional changes happen or sort of planning for institutional changes. Um, I'm curious if that's, there are certain standards that have existed or if they've shifted, particularly in the digital era, um, which we're in now. Yeah. Um, so in, in general, there's no standards um, in, in the technology world um, that, are, that are embraced by, uh, by the environment of technologists. And Netflix probably could not have predicted the adoption curve associated with uh, moving from DVD to downloadable and then downloadable to streaming, right? I mean, these were, you know, th these were things that were, that, that were relevant to their business, but things they had no control over, right? So, the, the, the bandwidth increase in, in, in most of the first world um, moved at the rate that it moved. Um, there, were, there, there were telecom companies involved and chip companies involved. Netflix was just smart enough to actually 
embrace the change as it came. Um, so I don't think it's something predictable. However, um, innovation, sustainability, sometimes is driven by governments. Um, so sometimes, you know, the, the government is not driving the adoption or bandwidth. The government doesn't say we need to be at this many gigabits per second for bandwidth or we're not happy. Um, but governments do drive um, uh, regulatory changes that can impact companies greatly. So think about just what's happening in, you know, electronic vehicles. Um, you know, you have governments and, and not only federal governments, but state governments in the United States that are making up their own stupid ass rules, uh, you know, that, oh, we're going to be at this much, you know, uh, electric vehicles, or we're going to be at this much carbon emissions. Um, they're all going to disagree and fight. But at the end of the day, you got to be smart enough to look at this trend and say, wow, I don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. But sooner or later, I can predict that within X period of time, there's going to be a requirement that these things must exist. And if you're smart enough to sort of read those tea leaves, hopefully your company can adapt, right? I mean, at, at one point, no cars had seatbelts. Government regulation required cars to have seatbelts. At one point, no cars had airbags. Government regulation slowly adapted to that. Well, if, if you were a company building steering wheels and you were smart enough to start building airbags into your steering wheels, you probably made billions. But most people probably didn't. So looking at how governments are thinking about changes within regulation is absolutely critical. A great example is certainly EV. Another example would be cryptocurrency. So you can be a complete cowboy and invest in everything crypto, um, or you can kind of look at how are governments beginning to modify their rules and how do I get ahead of the curve? Or maybe you do both to hedge. Um, but, Governments don't build technologies, they just figure out how to regulate it. Um, so if you can kind of manage uh, a view as to how governments are making decisions and how technologies are evolving, uh, it's quite powerful. Thank you. Good, and uh, Rich, I think the breakout rooms have closed and people are back, is that right? Uh, Jimmy, are you? That's, yeah. okay. That's correct, everyone's back. Good. Well, uh, Rich, thanks for the first session and sticking around thanks for sure. questions. And of course, let's have some virtual applause, I think, would be right. And as I said to Bob last night, the check's in the mail. Uh, <laughs> so it'll be good. Uh, welcome to stay uh, for the second part of the evening. Uh, I, I know how much you love this, but don't feel you have to. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. And, uh, and, and, and Joe will um, and the team will have my slides and, and my contact info along with those. You know, Really appreciate all your great questions and, and best of luck for all of you. Thank you.